Good evening. For those of you I've not yet had the chance to meet, my name is John Heibusch, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. I'd like to start by noting that our forum this evening has been made possible by our friends at General Electric. They are the presenting sponsor of the Reagan Centennial in 2011, and without them, events like this wouldn't be possible. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. Now, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some special guests that we have with us this evening. There are several. I'll start with from our Board of Trustees, the former Ambassador to the Court of St. James, Bob Tuttle. Bob, thank you for coming. Uh, the wife of our terrific Congressman, Elton Gallagly, Janice Gallagly, Janice, and there you are. From the California State Senate, uh, State Senator Sharon Runner. Sharon. Uh, from the California State Assemblyman, uh, Assembly, Assemblywoman Shannon Grove. From the City of Simi Valley, City Manager Mike Sedell, Councilman Mike Judge, Councilman Steve Soika, Councilwoman Barbara Williamson, and Mayor Bob Huber. From the city of Westlake, Councilwoman Philippa Klesik. From Ventura County, Ventura County Supervisor Peter Foy and Ventura County Clerk and Reporter, uh, Recorder Mark Lunn. From the great University of Southern California, Dean Jack Knott. Dean. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Reagan Library Director, Duke Blackwood. Duke. <laughs> Just over one week ago, our nation honored the many innocent Americans who lost their lives during the terrible attack of 9-11. We also paid tribute at that time to our men and women in uniform, whether they served in our armed forces or as first responders in our fire and police departments. Thousands, including some in this room tonight, gathered here at the Reagan Library on that day to pay tribute to those who, in the course of their daily work, serve with courage and humility as they selflessly protect our lives, our freedom, and our way of life. We called them heroes, all of them. Here we are, just over a week later, on another special day. While the date of September 20th has no particular importance in history that I could find, I am sure that for the more than 1,000 of you gathered here this evening, it is indeed special. And that is because tonight we are in the presence of another true American hero, Vice President Cheney and Liz, welcome to the Reagan Library. Now, I had the chance to look up the definition of hero in the dictionary. One definition of the term from the ancient uh, mythology I found particularly interesting was this. Hero, a being of godlike prowess and beneficence who often came to be honored as a divinity. While that is a powerful definition, I doubt that even Liz or the rest of the vice president's family might buy that as the best description of their dad. <laughs> But here is another more modern definition, one that I know both his family and millions of people in this country would easily embrace. Hero, a man of distinguished courage or ability, admired for his brave deeds and noble qualities. I like that one. But in all honesty, it does not do the man justice. How do you define someone 
who has quite literally dedicated his entire life to his country. Someone who has faithfully served five presidents and in the process has selflessly come to the aid of our country in times of great crisis. He was the glue that held the White House together during the perilous transition from the Nixon to the Ford presidency post Watergate. He served as the youngest chief of staff to a president in US history. Any younger, and he would have been in high school at the time. <laughs> he was the Secretary of Defense for President George H.W. Bush. He helped plan and execute operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm to retake Kuwait. He was also there to help ensure the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union in a post-Cold War world. He was the 46th Vice President of the United States, who, like any good wingman, provided the cover and took the flak for President George W. Bush post 9-11. Together, they let not a single enemy sleep as they protected our lives. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Now, if any of you are counting, that's four presidents I've listed, not five as I previously noted. The fifth that Vice President Cheney served with great honor, perhaps not directly, but certainly with great, great honor, and without hesitation, was Ronald Reagan. First as a foot soldier during, the, uh, during his time in Congress, and then as a member of the Intelligence Committee and Deputy Minority Leader of the House, Representative Dick Cheney of Wyoming was a critical and respected player on Capitol Hill who helped make President Reagan's legislative program, indeed the Reagan Revolution, a reality. And true to form, as was the case for these other presidents, it was Vice President Cheney who was there for President Reagan in his trademark fashion, providing calm and decisive support during some of his darkest hours. I urge you to get his book and read it to know what I mean. With him tonight to play the role of Diane Sawyer, well, <laughs> Okay, Liz, maybe not Diane Sawyer, is his co-author and CEO of his book project, Liz Cheney. Liz, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs under President Bush, is active in numerous conservative causes of which I am sure her father most heartily approves. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Vice President Dick Cheney and his wonderful daughter, Liz. You gonna start? You want me to start? Uh, no. <laughs> no, you get there soon enough. Um, I uh, first of all, I want to say how much we uh, enjoy and appreciate the opportunity to come visit the Reagan Library. I've been here a number of times over the years, but I'm always struck by what a magnificent institution and installation it is. Uh, today, I got back on Air Force One. That's the Air Force One we used to fly when I was Chief of Staff, and uh, walked uh, through it and, and uh, renewed a lot of old memories. And it's, it's truly, um, I think, uh, I'll have to be careful because I'm working at all of the presidential libraries on this book promotion. Uh, <laughs> but you'd be hard put to find any that uh, can equal the uh, magnificent facility that's, that's been built here. It really is uh, truly remarkable. I. Um, let me just say a word or two about how I've been spending my time since I left office, a little over uh, almost three years ago now in January. And then I'll throw it open uh, over to Liz, and she will proceed to interview me. And you, and you might say, why would you have your daughter interview you? Well, she knows uh, she was my co-author in every, every uh, meaning of the word. She knows all the material we put in the book, and she knows some of the stuff we left out. And uh, she's uh, the toughest uh, interviewer we can find. And uh, I think uh, this uh, sort of warms her up so that she can take on Bill O'Reilly and some of those other folks. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
But I, uh, when I got started on, on the book, I'd of course been involved, went to Washington to stay uh, 12 months in 1968 and uh, ended up spending the better part of 40 years there. Uh, it wasn't a, a plan, obviously. It, it just sort of happened. And uh, we're going to talk about that, and that's partly what the book's about. But um, as I left office, I thought about writing a book. I'd never decided, and I'd, I'd never uh, operated on the basis that I was going to write a book. But it began to occur to me that I was, after all these years, uh, of 70 years old, that I was reaching the point where it was time to pause and reflect and think about what I'd done with my life and why I'd done it. And also, I thought about it in terms of leaving a record for my uh, children and my grandchildren, and um, that they'd be able to look back 50 or 100 years from now, that's what it took, and, and someplace find a, um, my words explaining what I did and why I did it and how we did it. And uh, I wanted to leave that kind of uh, record behind. And then that concept sort of expands into, well, other people are going to be writing histories. And you want to leave your uh, view of the events you participated in and what kinds of thoughts uh, were considered and so forth. So it grew into this project uh, where we had some publishers obviously interested. And uh, finally, Simon and Schuster um, signed up. and. Uh, and we wrote a book, <clears throat> spent about uh, two years on it. In the middle of it, I got, um, um, had serious health problems. I'd, many of you know I've been uh, involved in, as a cardiac patient going back to my, my uh, first campaign for Congress in, when I was 37 years old. And by the time uh, we got into February of last year, February of 2010, I'd had my fifth heart attack and uh, a bunch of procedures over the years. Uh, it was my great good fortune that the technology stayed ahead of my disease. So <laughs> when uh, I needed bypass, they had bypass. And when I needed uh, stents, they had stents. And when I needed a defibrillator implanted in my chest, uh, uh, somebody had invented one. And, uh, but when I got down into uh, the spring of last year, I was approaching end stage heart failure. My heart was simply not working hard enough to move enough blood to meet the needs of all of my vital organs. So my kidneys and liver and so forth began to shut down. We went in uh, July 6th of last year on an emergency basis. They worked on me all one night and implanted what's called a heart pump. We don't have artificial hearts yet, but uh, they do have a pump now that they can install and uh, it uh, basically supplements the actions of the heart and restored my, uh, my normal blood flow. Uh, it's miracle stuff, it's, but it's the reason I wear this vest is because I'm, I'm battery powered. I've got to have power all the time. This is not my favorite part of the performance. I'd love to <laughs> take it out, show everybody the battery, and, uh, and then it beeps. <laughs> when you do that in the middle of a television interview, it drives them nuts. <laughs> they, uh, the uh, questioner completely loses their train, train of thought. Uh, it's a great way to, to uh, take control of the situation. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that, that combination of circumstances in terms of sort of wanting to do the book and starting on the book, having a signed contract, but then the health problems that accompanied it. Um, Liz played a very, very important role through that whole process. And uh, we had accumulated a lot of material, and uh, I dictated a lot. Uh, and uh, there was a, I didn't keep a diary in that sense, but there was a, a vast amount of material that we'd collected over the years, oral histories that were done on various parts of my career and so forth. So there was plenty to work with. and. Um, she and uh, her sister and mother saw me through my, my illness. And uh, after five weeks in the intensive care unit, um, heavily sedated uh, on respirators all the time, I emerged from that process uh, significantly diminished in terms of my physical strength. But uh, we were able to deal with that through uh, physical rehabilitation. And uh, in the meantime, I was uh, um, 
with it enough to keep checking to see how the book was coming. <laughs> and, uh, but Liz, uh, Liz did wonders for me in that regard. And one of the great uh, experiences has been to have a child. I think of her as a child. I remember when she was two years old and had pigtails. Uh, but now have I'm your like daughter. Or so. Yes, that's right. <laughs> to have your daughter interested enough in your life and what you did with it um, to be willing to sit there and listen endlessly to old war stories about what I did in my, uh, my youth as well as during the course of my career. But uh, that opportunity to share that book writing experience with, uh, with Liz has been uh, one of the high points of, uh, of my life. I've enjoyed it immensely. I'm very proud uh, she's my daughter. And uh, I will, uh, well, I'm going to watch carefully to see how she conducts herself this evening. <laughs> <laughs> so Liz, it's all yours. Well, thank you. It's uh, true that it, it has just been a tremendous blessing to work with my dad on this book and to have the chance to, to talk to him about his life and his career. And, um, you know, as an American, I have been obviously extremely grateful for everything that he has done to keep us safe. Um, as his daughter, I love him very much. And um, one of the real interesting parts of this book process was having the chance to really probe him about stories that he had not been willing to discuss previously. And uh, one of those has to do with um, a certain jail cell in Rock Springs, Wyoming, <laughs> in uh, July 1963. And uh, it is truly an amazing thing if you think about the fact that on July 28, 1963, my father woke up in this jail cell in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Um, his life clearly not on a good path, but, and we're going to find out some details about that in a second, but less than about 12 years later, you were the youngest White House Chief of Staff in history. And, you know, I know I was curious, and I imagine lots of people are curious to know how in the world did that happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, uh, when, when I got out of high school, I was recruited to go to Yale by a very nice alumni representative in my hometown of Casper. Um, my family didn't have that kind of money, obviously, and so they gave me a full financial scholarship package, and uh, I went off to Yale. And uh, the second time they kicked me out, they said, don't come back. <laughs> uh, uh, unbeknownst to them, years later, after I'd been Secretary of Defense through Desert Storm, uh, they invited me as the Secretary of Defense to come address a large alumni group uh, <laughs> about this size at, uh, in, the, in the dining hall where I used to sling hash when I was a freshman. And uh, I went and spoke and was very well received. And I'm convinced that to this day they had no idea that I'd been kicked out <laughs> 30 years before. But um, be that as it may, when I, uh, uh, I went back to Wyoming uh, where since the summer I got out of high school I'd been working um, done power line transmission line. It's, I got a union ticket in the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and traveled around Wyoming and Colorado and Utah building power lines and, and power plants and laying cable between missile silos at Warren Air Force Base and uh, working in the tools and enjoyed it. I was good at it. Um, but we also uh, spent a lot of time after work uh, in the local establishments. <laughs> consuming vast quantities of beer, which was a, an important part of the deal. Uh, I laugh about it now, but at the time it, it uh, became a very serious proposition because I'd ended up in uh, Liz, uh, the summer of 1963, my classmates were all graduating, uh, going on to graduate school or law school or beginning their lives. My uh, uh, wife, um, Liz's mother, not at that stage, but uh, <laughs> later on, was uh, graduating magna cum laude from a uh, school in Colorado, Colorado College. Summa. Summa cum laude. Uh, and uh, I was sleeping off a hangover in the Rock Springs Jail. <laughs> and it was the second time I'd been arrested in less than a year. And um, so after uh, that experience, I decided that uh, I, if I stayed on the path I was on, I was, I was headed for big trouble. 
It was a train wreck, uh, likely, at the end of that experience. And um, so I decided after uh, spent some time with Lynn, she made it clear she wasn't going to marry somebody who uh, spent his life doing what I was doing at the time, um, and uh, had the opportunity to pause and reflect for a day or two, I decided I needed to get my act together. So I went uh, back to work on the job I was working at the time, which was down uh, south of Rock Springs, building a big uh, 230 kV power line that's thousands of volts into uh, Flaming Gorge down on the Wyoming-Utah uh, border, and um, started camping out on the job during the week and only going to town on the weekends to do my laundry and replenish the groceries. And, and um, at the end of the summer, I enrolled at the University of Wyoming. And it turned out, uh, if I worked hard, I was a pretty good student. You know, I hadn't <laughs> figured that out before that. But I, uh, I was able, with what I earned summers and what I earned part-time while I was going to school, to uh, pay my way through uh, getting both a BA and a master's degree. Uh, Lynn was then going to school down at the University of Colorado. I spent my weekends down visiting with her and then my uh, weeks back up at school and a year later we got married and uh, 1964 and went off uh, eventually to Wisconsin. Uh, I had a political job in the Wyoming State Legislature then worked a year for the governor of Wisconsin. Got uh, both the BA and MA finished at Wyoming. Did a all the work for a PhD except the dissertation at the University of Wisconsin and went to Washington with a grant to, uh, as a congressional fellow, to uh, spend a year learning about the Congress, working on Capitol Hill, and then I was supposed to go back to Wisconsin and, uh, and uh, there I was going to write my dissertation and, and become a professor. I thought I wanted to teach political science. Uh, instead I ran into a guy named Don Rumsfeld. And uh, Rummy, as his friends call him, um, first time I went in to uh, talk to him, we, you had to negotiate your own arrangement as a congressional fellow with a member of Congress, but you were free help to the congressman. The foundation was paying your salary. And Rumsfeld had spoken to our group, and I was suitably impressed. So I made an appointment to go in and, and to see about going to work for him. And, uh, uh, they ushered me into his office, and I was there ab about 10 minutes, and I found myself back out in the hallway. And uh, he uh, stood up partway through the interview. I thought we were just starting to roll. He stood up and he said, this isn't going to work. Boom. And uh, he's, he's not a warm and fuzzy guy. He never was. <coughs> um, so I was, uh, needless to say, not pleased. But I went down the hall and went to work for a guy named Bill Steiger, who was a great American, then a young congressman from Wisconsin. And, and um, some months later, when Rumsfeld was named by President Nixon to run the anti-poverty program, I sat down one night and wrote him a lengthy memo, a 12-page memo, on how he ought to handle himself in his confirmation hearings, what he ought to do with the agency once he took over. Uh, it was a little forward-leaning, but... Uh, <laughs> I gave the memo to Bill Steiger, and he passed it on to Rumsfeld, and I didn't hear any more about it for a couple of weeks. Then he got confirmed and sworn in, and I got a phone call uh, invited to come down to the Office of Economic Opportunity the next day and become part of a team that was going to advise him uh, on the transition, on how he could get up and running. So the next morning I went down, about 50 of us gathered in a conference room, Don came in spoke to the group, told us what he wanted to do, and then left. Then his secretary came in and said, is there anybody in here named Cheney? And I held my hand up. She said, come with me. And she took me back into Rumsfeld's office. It's his first day on the job. Uh, the roof leaks, their pans around catching the rain coming through. It really was the poverty office. And uh, <laughs> we ended up, uh, I walked in and had to wait a minute because he was focused on something on his desk. And he looked up at me. Uh, obviously recognized me. He said, you, you're Congressional Relations. Now get the hell out of here. Now he didn't say, I'm sorry I threw you out last time. <laughs> he didn't say, uh, you know, uh, would you like a job? Uh, or I liked the memo you sent me. He just said, you're Congressional Relations. Now beat it. And so I walked out into the hallway uh, and uh, asked where the Congressional Relations Office was. Secretary told me and I went down and 
took over and went to work. And I didn't realize it, but at that moment, I made a life-altering decision to, uh, that I was going to pursue a career in politics and government and public policy, and I never did get the dissertation done. I never did go back to, to academia. And um, I'm uh, extraordinarily fortunate that I ran into a guy like Don Rumsfeld, and uh, through him, Jerry Ford, and uh, had uh, well, a tremendous career. But the two of them were more responsible than just about anybody else for getting me to the point where I could take over uh, as White House Chief of Staff uh, when I was 34. You uh, mentioned uh, having the chance today to walk through Air Force One here at the library. What you didn't mention was that you spent hours and hours on that airplane as President Ford's Chief of Staff working hard to defeat Ronald Reagan in 1976. That's true. <laughs> That's true. And he never held it against me. <laughs> But you've also said that by 1980, we were all Reaganites. Right. And I, I thought it would be interesting if you could talk about the first time you met Ronald Reagan and, and that 76 election and how it came about that we all were Reaganites by 1980. Sure. Well, of course, um, the day Jerry Ford became president, August 9th of 1974, uh, I met Rumsfeld out at Dulles. Uh, I'd gotten a phone call. He was coming back from Brussels, uh, where he was ambassador to NATO and uh, got in the White House car with him, and he had a letter waiting for him from the president asking him to come and run the transition from the Nixon to the Ford administration. And he asked me if I'd sign on and help, which I was happy to do. So uh, I, I always remember driving in that southwest gate of the White House at the beginning of the transition period from Nixon to Ford, and um, thinking as we drove through that gate that day, uh, Don was a little bit older than I was, but not much. And that we were both just young enough and foolish enough to think we could do anything. And so we found ourselves uh, being asked to manage this transition. Um, later on that fall, uh, on a swing through the West, a campaign swing uh, that I was managing for President Ford, Rumsfeld and I used to alternate trips. He'd take one trip, I'd take the next one. But we came to Los Angeles and uh, to the Century Plaza Hotel where there was a big uh, Republican dinner that night, part of the 74 campaign. And uh, the um, uh, governor of California, then Ronald Reagan, uh, came up to the suite, uh, presidential suite, to uh, greet President Ford, and the two of them sat down. And I can still have the picture in my mind of them sitting there, it was, I think it's on the top floor, uh, the Century Plaza, great big huge floor to ceiling windows. And you could look out on the, I, know, I guess it's the Hollywood Hills, or see the lights of, of the city spread below. And I, I was in the room during the course of the meeting back. back. Uh, I didn't participate in the conversation. And watched the two of them interact. And they didn't know each other that well at that point, obviously. And, and uh, at that stage, Ford had only been in office a couple of months. and. Um, what became clear later on was they were going to run against each other for the Republican nomination in 76. But that wasn't obvious at that moment. And uh, I was tremendously impressed with, uh, with Governor Reagan in terms of uh, he carried himself like a president. A lot of people thought of him as, as president. And of course, Jerry Ford was my boss and uh, had, had a tremendous burden dropped on him uh, as uh, picked off the hill to be vice president for nine months, a job he often told me uh, he hated, that it was the worst nine months of his life being vice president. He usually brought that up after I became vice president. <laughs> <laughs> and he liked to remind me periodically, yeah, you got a great job there, Dick. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, was a great job, but I'll talk about that later. But um, that became, obviously, a... a uh, I think back on it now and reflect on it from a historical standpoint and so forth. That was a fantastic campaign, the contest between Reagan and Ford in the spring of 76, all the way down to the convention. I mean, it was, uh, it was so close and so hard fought uh, that the RNC, uh, when they put out the, the uh, convention program, had both men on the cover of the convention brochure because they didn't know who was going to win the nomination. And um, we had, uh, let's say, I, I've always considered a privilege to have been part of that operation. And of course, it's the last time 
uh, that Ronald Reagan lost anything, and uh, the uh, also the last time that Jerry Ford won anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether it was my my doing or not, but we um, uh, it, it was a, a fascinating campaign, and we could talk about that all night. But if if you fast forward, then after we lost in '76. Uh, against uh, Jimmy Carter, and I always, I always felt that that the Nixon pardon contributed significantly to our defeat. That it really was a very difficult task. We almost pulled it off. Gallup actually had us one point ahead, I think, on election day, but uh, it was a very close election. But uh, we weren't uh, weren't fated to win that one. But I went home to Wyoming then uh, in 1977, 78, uh, ran for Congress and got elected. And by 1980, I was running for re-election for my second term in the House. And uh, Ronald Reagan was the obvious choice uh, to be our candidate for president. Um, ran a magnificent campaign. I was delighted to uh, support him. As I say, by then, we were all Republicans, especially members of Congress, had become Reaganites and uh, believed very deeply in him and uh, were delighted to work with him for, for the next eight years. It seems to me that there are at least three big things that Ronald Reagan knew and understood. One was the importance of limited government. The second was the importance of low taxes. And the third was that America is the greatest nation that's ever existed on the face of the earth. And it also seems to me that President Obama missed those days of his American history lessons. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> she takes the good line and then passes it. Um, what lessons do you think President Obama could learn from President Reagan? Well, I, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, if uh, um, I would hope that what emerges from this election campaign that we're in the middle of now uh, is uh, another Ronald Reagan. I'm, I worry that if. Uh, if uh, President Obama gets reelected, and obviously I'm a conservative Republican, but I'm worried what we'll get is another Jimmy Carter. And that would be unfortunate. I, uh, I just fundamentally disagree with President Obama. I uh, try not to be overly partisan about it in these settings. <laughs> Might be some Democrats out there that want to buy books. Uh, <laughs> so, but um, the... Uh, um, the, the problems we're faced with now in terms of uh, our situation with respect to our long-term debt outlook um, and uh, uh, the economic circumstances, high unemployment, the inability to put together and get past a program uh, strike me as uh, very worrisome. I hark back to the Reagan years. I see Pete Wilson in the audience. Pete remembers a lot of this. Um, we had... Uh, well, two things that are, are relevant now. One was uh, Social Security. And we had a situation in 1983 when we were worried that the Social Security system was going to collapse and we weren't going to be able to pay the, the uh, monthly checks to the recipients and uh, put together a bipartisan operation. Alan Greenspan shared it and eventually got a package that was approved by the Congress and supported by President Reagan and supported by Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House, and the members of Congress of both parties. And that's the last time we really um, enacted any major reforms with respect to Social Security. Uh, but it worked. I uh, always um, remember, too, as we talk about the tax uh, situation, of course, we're in the middle now of more debate on taxes. Um, and I don't like what the President has as proposed in that regard at all. But I do remember, I think it was, must have been about 86, when the administration, Reagan administration, was moving a reform package uh, on the tax side that was going to close off a lot of loopholes, but then reduce rates and broaden the base. And uh, it was uh, the last time, really, that we had a really major tax reform. We did some of it, obviously, at the beginning of the Bush administration. But I always remember that, uh, that issue because there was not unanimous support on Capitol Hill for what the president was trying to do. 
part of the problem was that the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives and the Republicans controlled the Senate. And uh, the bill that came out of the Democratic controlled House of Representatives out of Ways and Means Committee was one we Republicans really didn't like. It wasn't anything like what the president wanted. Uh, the arguments we got from uh, downtown were, well, you guys go ahead and vote for it, and then we'll send it over to the Republican Senate, and we'll clean it up over there. Well, uh, the House Republicans were a surly group and occasionally got a little rambunctious. And so what happened in that case was that we voted down the rule under which uh, we would have debated the tax bill, so we never got to the tax bill. Just the White House sent it up, the committee reported it out, we didn't like it, the House voted against the rule, so all of a sudden the President's uh, tax program is in some considerable difficulty. And uh, we got a phone call from downtown saying, the President would like to come talk to his wayward Republican friends. And um, he, uh, in the meantime, there'd been a, a um, terrible accident uh, in, in Canada. We had a plane load of troops coming back from the Sinai, and the plane had crashed on takeoff from the airport up in Canada, and we lost uh, a good number of soldiers out of the 101st. And uh, on this particular day that the president was going to come to the Hill, he uh, first went down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and participated in this memorial service for the guys we'd lost in that plane crash. And then he came straight up to to the Hill when he got back to Washington and walked in. We had all the Republicans gathered together in one of the big hearing rooms in the House or Abram building. And uh, the president talked about that service that he'd just been to. And he talked about uh, sacrifice and patriotism and what it meant to be an American. And it was one of those kinds of, of off-the-cuff uh, remarks uh, without a note that Ronald Reagan was uh, so capable of and generated so much emotion in that audience that there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd when he finished. And then he stopped and he paused and he said, now gentlemen, he said about that tax bill. <laughs> and people started jumping up all over the place. Henry Hyde was the first. And uh, he turned around 70 votes there in about 15 minutes. He never had to talk about what was in the bill. All he had to say was gentlemen about that tax bill. And uh, we did a 180 and took it back to the floor that day and passed it and did exactly what he wanted, sent it off over to the Senate where they cleaned it up and, and uh, were able to produce uh, acceptable legislation out of it. But it was the kind of leadership that, uh, that uh, President Reagan was very good at. And uh, I, I, he, he would frequently surprise you in terms of how he would respond in particular events. One more story and then I'll... It's all, it's all yours. <laughs> I uh, remember the day he came up, this was during the transition, and I was a brand new me member of the House Republican leadership. I'd just been elected chairman of the policy committee. And so this is probably December of 1980. He's been elected, but not yet sworn in. And uh, we had a meeting of the bipartisan leadership uh, off the floor of the Senate. And uh, Tip O'Neill was there for the House Democrats and so forth, I was there on the Republican side. And there were probably, I don't know, 14, 15, 16 members gathered around a big circle and there was an empty chair there. And the president came in, went over and the chair was for him, obviously. He sat down and, and we were having this meeting, a very nice sort of get acquainted meeting with the newly elected president of the United States. And uh, Tip reached in his pocket and pulled out a, a piece of paper and he started going through it. A long list of detailed policy questions that he wanted to talk about. What are we going to do about tax policy? And what about the budget? And how soon can we expect your legislative proposals? And he just, you know, was right down to business running through uh, his agenda. And he got all through and he turned to the president, uh, expecting the president to respond to these questions he just asked. And the president didn't respond. He told a joke <laughs> <laughs> about some Irish movie actor. And uh, it was just totally deflated. The, uh, the speaker, he, he had not expected or anticipated that. And, uh, but it was, it was exactly the right touch at the right time uh, to start off that relationship uh, with the leadership of both parties in the Congress with the new president of the United States. And uh, he could do that you know, with greater skill than, uh, than uh, just about anybody else. So anyway, I'll stop. You, you talk in the book about um, 
two men that you thanked when you were Secretary of Defense after the victory that we had uh, liberating Kuwait and pushing Saddam back into Iraq. One of them was David Ivory, um, who'd been the Israeli ambassador to the U.S., and another was uh, Ronald Reagan. And, and I think it'd be nice if you could tell the story about why those two men. Yes, I, um, well, David Ivory, I think, because he'd been in command of the Israeli Air Force in uh, 1981 when they'd taken out the uh, nuclear reactor that the Iraqis were building at, at uh, Osirik. And I sent him a picture of what was left after we had worked it over during the course of the uh, campaign um, with um, Operation Desert Storm and signed it and thanked David for what he'd done when he was head of the Israeli Air Force that made our task much easier 10 years later when we went in with uh, our forces in, uh, in Desert Storm. But um, the other thing I did, the other man I thanked was, was President Reagan. And I was the, uh, the incumbent Secretary of Defense. It was that period of time immediately after Desert Storm when we bringing all the troops home. And uh, there were magnificent celebrations all across the country. I mean, I can remember riding up uh, Broadway in a ticker tape parade with the troops and uh, Generals uh, Powell and Schwarzkopf or the uh, parade that uh, we did uh, for the troops in, uh, in Washington up Constitution Avenue where my great-grandfather had marched uh, at the end of the Civil War with uh, was part of Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman's command. Um, it was just a very, very special time uh, in American history because everybody wanted to thank the troops for this tremendous job they'd done in the desert. And, uh, but one thing I wanted to do and did do was to come thank President Reagan. And uh, I remember being invited to go visit uh, at the home down here in Los Angeles uh, one afternoon. I was coming out for some other purpose and we worked it out so that I could go by the house and spend some time with him. This would have been the spring of 91, right after Desert Storm was over with. And um, I wanted to go and did thank him for the tremendous investment he'd made back in the early 80s when he was president in rebuilding America's military. That's when we made the transition to the all-volunteer force. That's when we bought an awful lot of that equipment. There's an F-15 parked outside here today. That was one of the systems we uh, acquired during that period of time. But the uh, capabilities that the troops used in the, in the desert uh, to uh, defeat the Iraqis as decisively as we did and in terms of the ground war, only I think about 100 hours. All of that uh, was due to the equipment that we had because of the, the foresight, if you will, of President Reagan and, and his administration. He'd spent the money, bought the equipment, invested in the technology, and made it possible 10 years later for us to uh, win a magnificent victory in very short order. And um, so I went to to Los Angeles and spent an afternoon and uh, had a great chat with the president. He was deeply interested in, in what had happened and how we'd done it and so forth, but also very interested in, in Russia. And we talked a lot that afternoon, as I recall as well, about uh, Gorbachev and about what was going on inside the old Soviet Union that was in the stages of, uh, of collapse at that point. Which of the uh, Republican candidates this time around would you say reminds you most of Ronald Reagan? Oh, boy. Uh -huh. Huh. That's, that's a new question. That's not, uh, Just popped into my mind. not been raised before. It, um, I'm, I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I have not endorsed anybody in our uh, nomination battle on our side, and I don't want to start here today. And it would be very hard to identify somebody as the next Ronald Reagan and uh, not have people believe I was giving an endorsement of some kind. I, I didn't think you'd answer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, moving ahead to the, your time as vice president, almost from the day you were selected, there were these stories that somehow you were in charge, that you were really running things, that you were sort of you know, some kind of a, a puppeteer. And when I hear those stories, I think those are people who don't know that your dog was banned from one of the main buildings at Camp David. 
and that if you truly had been in charge, certainly your dog wouldn't have been banned from this building. <laughs> I thought maybe you could tell that story. Well, yeah, yeah it's a good story, and, it, and we, uh, we mentioned it in the book. We had on 9-11, um, on the night of 9-11, as uh, things settled down, the president got back to the White House and so forth, Lynn and I were evacuated to Camp David, which was the remote, undisclosed location that we sometimes used uh, during that period of time. We were, um, and then the Secret Service was very concerned to make certain the president and I didn't bunch up. We didn't want to be in a situation where we could have a decapitation strike against our government. So we spent a lot of time in those early days after 9-11 making certain that, that uh, they couldn't take us both out at the same time. So that night, um, we went up to Camp David, and uh, uh, the Secret Service then brought Liz and her family up, and we spent the next few days up there. And we went back a number of times uh, throughout that fall of, of 2001. But um, one of the, um, the items that came when, whenever the family moved up to Camp David temporarily was a 100-pound yellow lab oh. named Dave. <laughs> Dave was his name, uh, and he was Liz's dog. Liz had gone out and, and uh, acquired this magnificent yellow lab. And anybody who's a dog lover knows labs are very special. And, um, but uh, Liz, um, she had a little problem. We don't um, need to tell this part. Yeah, I do Dad. have to tell You can this actually <laughs> <laughs> skip ahead. When it's we moved into the vice president's residence, which was that magnificent old house down on Massachusetts Avenue, um, Liz came down one day and, and uh, had Dave in the car with her, as well as a couple of the grandkids. And um, she'd had one of these electronic fences, buried fences, around her yard where she lived out in Northern Virginia. And uh, it was the kind of thing, it had a collar on the dog, and if the dog tried to get through that electronic barrier, he'd get zapped. And so they quickly learned, you know, you don't cross that piece of grass. Well. Liz uh, sometimes would load Dave in her Jeep station wagon and um, get in the car and take off and drive through the barrier without I turning off. I had a lot off, of little kids. I was also off. getting in the car at the same time. She, she acquired <laughs> a family of five children, and it was, sometimes it was hard to keep track of uh, how it was all working out. But anyway, <laughs> after this had happened a few times, Dave came down to visit the vice president's residence. And when the visit was over, he would not get back in that Jeep. That's <laughs> true. He, he was slow, but he was no fool. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, he moved in with us. He became our dog. <laughs> he, he had a bit of a loyalty problem, but he was a great dog. He was, he was a, a, a defector, if you will. And he, he literally lived with us then for the next eight years. But, um, uh, and the Secret Service would, when, say, when we went to Camp David, David frequently would go along. He loved it up there. He loved to ride around in the golf carts with me and uh, you know, run the trails and chase squirrels and, and do those things. He never caught a squirrel, but he loved to chase them. And um, one morning I took him down to Laurel, which is, is the big lodge at Camp David that was built in the Nixon administration. It's a big um, cabinet room there where you can have cabinet meetings, fairly sized dining room. Uh, the president's got an office there where he works out of. There's a very nice sort of lounge where you can play music on the piano or have meetings or receptions, whatever you want to do. And um, Dave uh, got on the golf cart with me, and I drove down to Laurel and uh, had an armful of paper in one, one arm. And then Dave got off. I parked the golf cart right outside Laurel and went up the walk and through the front door and uh, got inside. And right around to the left is the dining room. And as I started to step around that corner, Dave spotted Barney. Now, Barney was the little black Scotty that uh, <coughs> had been given to the president as a gift by um, uh, Governor Whitman from New Jersey, who was then running the EPA. But um, you know, he had little bitty legs. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> But it's also true that he was mean. <laughs> I mean the, on more than one occasion, Scotty was guilty of attacking uh, the president's guest. Uh, and uh, there's one senior staff member who should remain nameless had to have stitches taken in his hand 
in the doctor's office downstairs one night after uh, at the White House, but I don't want to go down that. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Dave spots Barney in the dining room, a couple of cabinet wives sitting there at the table having breakfast. Uh, I'm expecting to go in and have breakfast, but Dave spots Barney and he takes off after Barney. And uh, of course, Dave's big and he's lumbering along and he's, Barney's just running like crazy, his legs just <laughs> pumping away, and they start doing circles around the dining room table. <laughs> and um, about that time, uh, the president walked in. And he said, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> Which, when you think of it, is not an unreasonable question. <laughs> and uh, I grabbed a pastry off the tray and hollered, Dave, treat. <laughs> the only thing he liked more than chasing squirrels was eating. And so I, I got Dave over and got hold of him and took him back out of the lodge and out and got him on the golf cart and drove back up to the cabin where Lynn and I were staying and um, took Dave inside. And uh, we'd been there, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, and there was a knock at the door. And uh, I went, and there was the camp commander, Navy captain, uh, in his uh, dress blues. And uh, he said, uh, Mr. Vice President, he said, sir, until further notice, your dog Dave is banned from Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> so, in case, Anybody was under the mistaken notion that I was running the show. Uh, I couldn't even get my dog into the mess hall. Um, but we, uh, uh, to, to be serious for a moment, the, uh, that suggestion that somehow I was in charge was just baloney. It was never true. There was never any doubt about who was running the show. And the president was tremendous at giving me um, significant responsibilities, at listening to me, allowing me to make arguments on behalf of various and sundry policies and issues and personnel. Sometimes he agreed, sometimes he didn't, but there was never any doubt, excuse me, about um, who was in charge on, those, uh, on all of those issues. I was the vice president. I think uh, the relationship worked uh, very well, better than I'd seen it work in most administrations, um, but that was due primarily to the president. He's the one that made it go or not go, I'd seen um, good men come down to be vice president and to quickly grow frustrated uh, in the position because you know, unless the president is, uh, is on board for a program that allows you to, to play a significant role, uh, Jerry Ford's right. Uh, every time he told me it's a lousy job, Dick, uh, he knew what he was talking about. He'd, he'd say he'd done it for eight or nine months. But I think it worked especially well in our administration, but the one who gets the credit for making it work. Uh, was the president. I know that um, <clears throat> as vice president, and, and I think actually probably f when you look back on your whole career, um, your proudest accomplishment uh, is probably the policies that you put in place, the fact that you and the president were able after those attacks on 9-11 to keep the nation safe. And those are also the policies, the terrorist surveillance program and enhanced interrogation in particular that, that you've been so criticized for. Um, but I think what I'd like to know is, given how much intelligence we know we gained, particularly through enhanced interrogation, um, given the attacks that we know we prevented, um, why were only three people waterboarded? Hmm. <laughs> Did you have any other candidates? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, um, let me, let me, focus on that for a minute because the, on 9-11, you know, we pretty quickly concluded this was an Al-Qaeda operation that hit the World Trade Center and, uh, and the Pentagon and, and um, it was involved in, in Shanksville. Um, and that pointed in the direction of Osama bin Laden. Uh, George Tenet, the CIA director, was able to tell us that much the afternoon of 9-11. Of but there was an awful lot we did not know. Um, we didn't know, we, we thought there were more attacks planned, we didn't know where, we didn't know for sure where all their personnel were, we didn't know uh, where their financial support was coming from. Um, there were just a, it was a, a lot of questions that had to be answered. And uh, the biggest concern we had was that the next time there was an Al-Qaeda attack on the U.S., that the um, 
the terrorist would use something more deadly than airline tickets and box cutters, that they'd come with a biological agent or a nuclear weapon if they could get their hands on one, and um, that uh, an attack on one of our cities with that kind of technology obviously would be absolutely devastating. And we had to do everything we could in order to make certain that they could not do that, both in terms of denying them that technology, but doing everything we could to, to take down the organization. The um, first program we put in place in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 came to be called the Terrorist Surveillance Program. I'm convinced it is uh, one of the great success stories of American intelligence. It allowed us to, to read the mail, so to speak, to pick up on communications from suspect numbers. Uh, you capture a, a member of Al-Qaeda, he's got a Rolodex in his pocket or a hard drive, he's got information in his computer, his laptop, that tells you who he's been working with. It became what we called a dirty number. And under those circumstances, we were interested in uh, finding out everything we could about who he was communicating with and so forth. So we put together a program and got the authority for the National Security Agency to, to operate it. The president insisted that we safeguard the uh, right to privacy of, of uh, American citizens and so forth. We uh, set up a process that required his approval every 30 days in writing um, or the program had to be shut down. He wanted to have active, detailed control over that program uh, as long as it operated, and, and he did. And we eventually briefed the congressional leadership on what we were doing. Uh, it was a good program. I'm convinced it saved thousands of lives. Uh, eventually, part of it was disclosed uh, in the New York Times, which I just mentioned in passing uh, is a violation of, I think it's Section 798 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code. Um, uh, it's a felony offense uh, to publish uh, information, classified information, about U.S. communications intelligence. Now, the New York Times was never prosecuted. Uh, they um, got the uh, Pulitzer Prize, was the uh, compensation they got for having divulged uh, that information. The second program was enhanced interrogation. That really um, became more of a focal point in about 03 when we captured uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, the man who had uh, assassinated or beheaded Richard Pearl, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And there we went to uh, great lengths uh, working with the agency. Uh, they had certain techniques they wanted to be able to use on, on a handful of high-value targets that we had captured. Not rank-and-file soldiers, but we're talking about people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. <coughs> and um, before we did that, we wanted to make absolutely certain we had the legal authority, that we knew where the, the lines were in terms of what could and couldn't be done, and um, the president sign off and the sign off of the National Security Council. We got all those things before we went forward. Uh, the most uh, controversial of the techniques we used was waterboarding. Uh, we did that to three individuals, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, and a man named Nasiri. Uh, but uh, KSM was the, the prime uh, uh, figure involved in that enhanced interrogation program. It produced tremendous results. There was a classified report done uh, by the agency on the information how we'd learned about Al-Qaeda and answered those questions we had back on 9-11. Uh, most of it was provided by uh, the people who were involved in that in program of enhanced interrogation techniques. The report itself has now been declassified in an abridged form, but is available. And in fact, we had enormous success with that program. And I'm personally persuaded it saved thousands of American lives with the information that uh, we were able to produce from that. Uh, the other point that needs to be made is to remind people that all of the techniques that we utilized are techniques we use on our own people in training. So we've got a lot of Americans who've been through, for example, waterboarding as part of their, their escape and evasion training as a pilot uh, or in the special forces, special operation forces. And uh, that's the same technique that we used uh, when we got into running the uh, 
program with respect to KSM. So the notion that somehow we uh, walked away from our values, I believe, is what President Obama said at one point. He went to Cairo here a couple of years ago and made a speech saying that we had uh, walked away from traditional American values when we'd uh, gotten into the business of enhanced interrogation. Uh, I don't believe it for a minute. I believe it did save lives. And if I had to do it all over again, I would in a minute. We're going to take a, a few questions from the audience, but I just wanted uh, to ask if you would end by just saying a few words about our armed forces, because the men and women who serve in uniform have been such a part of your career, and I know it's been one of the highest honors you've had to work with them, and then maybe close with this invocation. Well, I, um, I was privileged uh, during my career, obviously, to work. Uh, I think I often said that the job of Secretary of Defense um, was the best job I ever had. Um, a lot of that was because of the men and women of the U.S. military and the fact that I was there at a fascinating time when we were heavily involved in Desert Storm and the end of the Cold War and so forth. Um, a lot of what made that go was the, uh, were the troops themselves, obviously, and uh, our special operations forces. And that's uh, a, a general category that's applied to groups like SEAL Team 6 that captured uh, Osama bin Laden here back in May, or uh, the Delta Force, or Task Force 160. They, uh, most, most of what they do is classified. They don't talk about it um, for good reason. But um, uh, Lynn and Liz and I had the opportunity um, here shortly before we left office. Uh, we were invited to uh, join um, some of our special operations guys and their families for a, a social occasion. Um, and uh, at that dinner, the uh, chaplain, um, a young man from Wyoming, just a coincidence that he was from Wyoming, but um, he gave the invocation. And it, it's very brief, but I was struck by, by it. And it had, uh, I think it captures um, the essence of, of what uh, the men and women in our military are all about today. And it basically says, we are soldiers, God, agents of correction. May our world see the power of faith. May our nation know the strength of selfless service. And may our enemies continue to taste the inescapable force of freedom. That says it all. Running short on time, so we have uh, time. The vice president has so kindly agreed to take a couple of questions from the audience, and it literally will be just a couple. Uh, all I ask is that if you have a question, you raise your hand. We have people in the aisles with uh, microphones, and if you could just wait till the microphone is in your hand, uh, we'll come right over here. Okay. Hi, Mr. Vi vice president. Um, I thought it was revealing that you said you excelled in the electrical uh, department, in the engineering. What do you think is an innate talent that you have that you can reflect about that provided you with this long career? Hmm. Well, I don't want to leave anybody with a false impression. Uh, that I was uh, especially skilled. You had a smart uh, wife and daughters. Pardon? You had a smart wife and daughters. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Liz, uh, Liz said I had a smart wife and daughters, and that's absolutely true. Um, well, I, I, it, it's interesting because I, uh, when I had that first heart attack when I was 37, I was in the middle of my first campaign for Congress, and uh, woke up one night 
uh, staying with friends down in Cheyenne, and it was a tingling sensation in the two fingers, small fingers on my left hand. And uh, it just tingled, that's all. It was no chest pain or anything like that. But I had a cousin who'd had a bad heart attack physician uh, a few days before, and I thought I'd better go have it checked out. So they took me to the hospital, Cheyenne Memorial, and I walked into the emergency room and passed out with a heart attack. And um, as I recovered from that, uh, I had an internist who was my doctor. We didn't have any cardiologists in those days in Wyoming. And um, I asked him, I said, Rick, I said, Am I, you know, do I have to give up the campaign? Do I have to forget about a career in politics and all that entails? And, and he thought for a minute and he said, heck no, Dick. He said, hard work never killed anybody. <laughs> um, now, I don't know whether or not that was good medical advice, <laughs> but it, uh, I took it to heart and uh, operated on the basis over the years that uh, I was enormously fortunate to live when I did. I'd been with my grandfather, I mentioned in the book, when I was 14 years old when he had his last heart attack and, and uh, was involved in getting my folks and getting the ambulance there and so forth. Um, when I think back to those days in the mid-50s, uh, there wasn't much we could do uh, by way of treating anybody with heart disease. We got uh, my grandfather to finally agree to only smoke four cigarettes a day, and that was major progress. Um, but it, uh, I've been very fortunate that the technologies uh, stayed ahead of my disease, I guess is the way I think about it. Uh, in terms of, of um, what I was able to do and accomplish in the political arena, I owe an awful lot to other people. And I think most of us that enjoy a certain amount of success, if we think about it, that's probably true as well too. I got a second chance. I, I helped create it, but you know, I really screwed up the first time around when I was given a great opportunity at one of the nation's finer uh, universities and um, found myself uh, blowing the, the chance that I'd been given. Um, but you often need a second chance in this life. Um, I had people who were willing to um, give me major responsibilities, Rumsfeld and Ford, who come immediately to mind, and um, they could have gone numerous other ways. I mean, when it came time to get my first White House pass, I needed a security clearance, and that meant the FBI had to go do a full field investigation. Well, you can guess what they found when they went out and started checking uh, to see if I had any kind of a, of a arrest record. And uh, Rumsfeld called me into his office and he asked me, he said, uh, uh, by this time, he's, I've, I've already been through a, a competition in effect and he's decided he wants to designate me as his top assistant. Um, but there were a lot of other good, really good, competent people with better records than I had. And um, he turned them all down, but he called me into his office and he asked me, he said, uh, the FBI has come back and said that you in fact uh, were arrested twice as a young man. And I said, that's right. He said, did you put it down on your application when you filled out the, the papers for employment? And I said, yes, sir, I did. And so he called his secretary and had her bring in the, the uh, forms and uh, looked at them and sure enough, I had in fact been very diligent and uh, hadn't tried to lie or mislead, uh, put it down straight. And um, he read it and then he looked up at me and he said, that's good enough for me. And away we went. And then uh, a couple of years later when we went to the White House and go to work <coughs> with Jerry Ford, I had to get my security clearance renewed and we went through the whole exercise a second time. And at that time, um, Don talked to uh, to President Ford, and President Ford basically said, look, Don, if, if uh, you want him uh, as your deputy, that's great, it's your call. And uh, he immediately took me under his wing, uh, let me have uh, wide open access. Uh, the president did, uh, treated me the same way he treated Rumsfeld, who was then the chief of staff, and I was the deputy. And um, you know, we were too busy to spend a lot of time on him. We just, we went to work. Um, so I always think about the, um, the, the times of, that uh, when I think about my, my career, there's a great temptation to look back and say, 
you know, I, I earned every bit of it. Well, it's not quite that way. If it hadn't been for Watergate and G. Gordon Liddy, I would never have been White House Chief of Staff. Um, later on, uh, when uh, um, I got to be Secretary of Defense, it was because uh, John Tower was rejected by his, uh, his own committee. John had been chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the Senate. It's the only time in history that uh, a president's uh, first pick for a major cabinet post has been rejected by the Senate. And the only time in history the Senate's ever rejected one of its own. Uh, and John Tower went down in flames. And I got the, uh, the request to go down. I, you know, I could say I, I was you know, in the right place at the right time and that that clearly had a lot to do with it. And uh, I knew George Bush and I'd worked closely with Jim Baker and, and uh, Brent Scowcroft and it was, you know, it been uh, part of the Ford team and, and uh, we were later to recreate a good part of that as part of the Bush team. But uh, I was fortunate to be where I was uh, when those occasions arose. And uh, I, uh, in the, the one place where people would say, yeah, but then look how you got to be vice president. You got to be head of the search committee. And uh, I worked out all right. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we have literally time for one last question. We'll go up here to the balcony. Mr. Vice President, the whole world um, saw where George Bush was and that look on his face uh, the day of 9-11 when he heard about the strike on the World Trade Center. Uh, where were you and what were your first thoughts? Well, I was uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that morning, um, I was in my West Wing office and uh, meeting with my speechwriter. Um, and my secretary called in on the, uh, the intercom and basically said that a plane had struck the World Trade Center in New York. And we turned on the television and it was a magnificent clear day, not a cloud in the sky. It, you know, you just sit there and looked at it and thought, it doesn't make any sense. How could you have run into that World Trade Center with a, a, a big airplane? And as we watched, the second plane went in. And we actually saw that. Um, shortly thereafter, I called the president and we got in touch with each other on the telephone and talked about what kind of statement he would put out, or just the basic judgment that this was an act of terror. And we both agreed it, it was. Uh, there's no other way to account for it. And that's what he said in his statement. Then um, by this time, this is uh, maybe oh, 20 minutes or so after the, uh, the first attack, then uh, I'd had some people had gathered in my office. And then all of a sudden, the door burst open. and. Uh, my Secret Service agent came in. He'd been standing post right outside my, my office. And uh, he came in and said, sir, we have to leave immediately. He didn't say, you know, would you please come with me or anything. <laughs> he uh, reached down, he put his hand on my belt, the back of my belt, and one hand on my shoulder and raised me up out of my chair and <laughs> propelled me out of the room. I think they practiced that carry, but it's, <laughs> it's very effective. And. Uh, he, he rushed me into, we were headed for what's called a, a emergency presidential operations center uh, underneath the White House. And um, as we uh, were partway there, we stopped in the tunnel. And uh, he explained to me the reason he'd evacuated me from my office was because he'd gotten a report over his radio net, his earpiece, that uh, there was a hijacked, apparently hijacked airliner um, passing Dulles at very low altitude at 500 miles an hour headed for Crown. The Crown was the code word for the White House. And um, that, uh, in fact, was American Flight 77 that did a big circle that came in from the west, did a circle, and then went in and, and struck the Pentagon. Um, I got on the horn with the president again from that tunnel, there was a secure phone right there. And um, uh, it was the second or third time we talked that morning. I recommended that he not come back right away. Uh, the Secret Service were trying to get him to stay away. Uh, the problem was, I told him, the, uh, Washington was also under attack, not just New York. And uh, that it was important 
in terms of the continuity of government that he, uh, uh, he wait before he came back. We didn't want us both bunched up in the same location. Um, there was a program that operated for years uh, in the days of the Cold War that um, I'd been part of in various capacities as White House Chief of Staff, Secretary of Defense, member of the Intel Committee and so forth. And uh, it basically was, was planning for what we would do in the event there was ever a major nuclear attack against the United States and how we would do it. And one of the elements of that uh, program was what we called continuity of government. Uh, and that was making certain that there was always a successor, a legitimate successor to the presidency available in a secure location. So that if the president was taken out and I was taken out, then uh, you'd have uh, the Speaker of the House, Denny Hastert in this case, at a secure location, which is what we did that day. So I spent the day uh, in the emergency operations bunker. We worked, uh, worked with Norm Mineta as we tried to get all the airplanes down out of the sky. We had, uh, when I arrived in the bunker, they had a list of six aircraft they believed had been hijacked, had the f actual flight numbers. Uh, turned out there were only four, but we didn't know it initially. We had a number of flights coming in from overseas that we had to divert. We didn't want them coming on into the U.S. Some of them were actually transponding the, the uh, code that uh, they had been hijacked. We had one Korean airliner come in over Alaska. We had to scramble F-15s for. Um, there was uh, a, um, a series of decisions like that that uh, basically I was involved in um, during the course of the day. And because the president wasn't there, I got a lot of, a lot of business down in the PIOC until he got back that late afternoon at an NSC meeting. He spoke to the country, and then that evening we went up to Camp David. Um, that's how we spent the day. If uh, you've got a book, it's uh, covered in the prologue in the book, uh, as I remember the highlights, the high points of that day. It was an um, um, emotional day for everybody involved, obviously. Uh, the, the moments when the towers came down in the New York, uh, I think, had a huge impact on, uh, on everybody. And of course, it was the most devastating attack uh, that we'd seen since 1814 when the British burned the White House. It was a, um, clearly a day I'll never forget. And uh, we worked uh, the phones. The president was heavily involved in everything we were doing. Uh, Rumsfeld was, obviously, as, as a Secretary of Defense, and uh, Norm Manetta as Secretary of Transportation. But um, everybody turned to. I think we did some good work that day in light of what happened. And uh, of course, that set of events during that two hours that morning uh, shaped everything we did then as an administration for the rest of our time in office. That became the dominant theme for us. Um, the president and myself uh, said to each other, we're never going to let this happen again, not on our watch. Thank you all for coming tonight. If I can ask just two favors of you. The first is to allow the Vice President to be escorted out before you uh, move from your seat. And the second is to join me once again in saying thank you to an American hero. Yeah.